It's now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr Vijay Roach, who will give us the opening address. Dr Vijay Roach is the President of the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists. He has been practising as an obstetrician and gynaecologist for 25 years with experience in both public and private practice in Sydney. He also uh, is involved in medical education, lecturing at the Universities of Sydney and Notre Dame, and he was the former chairman of the Gidgetation of Australia, a role in which he was able to passionately advocate for those affected by mental health disorders in pregnancy and early parenting. And he is very much so committed to raising awareness of the importance of emotional well-being. Dr Roach will speak to us about uh, a journey of moving from transactional to relational patient care and the impact on the risk of litigation. And certainly when one thinks about shifting to relational patient care, the question of telehealth comes to mind and certainly Dr Roach and I um, mentioned that just before the beginning of the session. So please join me in welcoming Dr Roach. Thank you, Dr Roach. Good morning. Good morning and thank you, Demetra. Thank you for that kind introduction. And I'd like to thank the organising committee for the opportunity to speak to you today. I also would like to begin by acknowledging the custodians of the land where I'm sitting, the Garingai people, and pay respects to their elders, past, present and future. Reflecting on the sorry history of the occupation of Australia, and our inability to overcome generations of dispossession, disenfranchisement and deprivation of a proud and sovereign people actually provides a powerful corollary to the theme of this talk. Perhaps the reason why so little progress has been made, why there is such a disconnect between postal Australians and Indigenous Australians, is that the first European never saw Aboriginal peoples no sense of commonality or connectedness. There was no empathy. Now, I know it's a bit of a stretch to say that there was any kind of transaction between the British and the Aborigines, but it is safe to say that there was no desire to develop a relationship. And the cost of that approach, which I think is still present today, is misunderstanding, mistrust, maltreatment, and as Aboriginal society and health are dis have disintegrated, there is despair and resentment and anger. In litigation associated with healthcare, we know that there's a vast body of literature around the role of an apology when an adverse outcome occurs. Now, setting aside the legal ramifications of the admission of liability, there is strong evidence that acknowledgement of an adverse outcome, validation of a patient's feelings, and reassurance that the circumstances are being investigated, that changes are being considered, reduces the chance of adversarial litigation. Alternatively, a contractual approach, which does not take into account the negative impact for the patient, is an almost certain pathway to anger, resentment and conflict. Unfortunately, the current legal system leaves no room for a Harvard-style win-win negotiation. Rather, it's win-loss only or maybe even loss-loss. A common line is that only the lawyers win, but I'm not even convinced that that's the case, because if you lose the case, then the compensation is minimal. Winning in this current system is everything. The theme that I want to develop today has a different starting point. In an, incre in an increasingly transactional world, does the failure of relational interaction affect a patient's perception of the care that they receive, and if there is a poor or unexpected outcome, a patient's reaction or level of acceptance. And I thought that maybe we might start with another example in a different area from medicine. Before the pandemic began, one of my favourite activities was flying. I loved the planning, going out to the airport, parking the car, sitting in the lounge, and then squeezing into an economy seat for a short domestic flight. I love the sense of solitude and escape. And what I noticed was the quality of service, the smile when I handed over my car keys, the welcome aboard, the attendant who looked me in the eye, 
when he handed me a coffee and a biscuit. If the plane was delayed, I didn't question the airline or the pilot. Rather, my inclination was to be understanding and accepting of the inconvenience because I felt as though I was valued. On another airline, where passengers were treated like numbers, had their bags weighed before they got on, ordered to line up in rows, and then constantly upsold food and beverages, a delay or cancellation would raise my ire, make me want to complain, and ultimately made me decide never to fly with them again. I saw a woman yesterday who was 39, and when she presented for IVF after 17 years of infertility, she was found to have a large cyst on her ovary. The cyst was removed and unfortunately found to be cancer, and so she needed to have a hysterectomy and her ovaries removed. The doctors were very happy with her progress, happy with the advice that she'd been given and the treatment that she'd received, and they pronounced it cured and they discharged her from their care. They didn't uh, discuss her anxiety or her grief or her sexuality or her job or her future. And at the moment, she feels really hurt and she feels angry and she's trying to process everything that's happened. And I bet that if there's a complication that arises out of her treatment, she will perceive that the care that she received was inadequate and she'll complain and she'll commence litigation. In obstetrics, when a woman seeks obstetric care, she's experiencing a profound life-changing event that will impact her socially, physically and emotionally. Overlaying this is an immense responsibility to be a life support system to a new human, her baby. In 2020, her sense of risk is distorted by an assumption that everything will work out exactly as she wishes it to, and acceptance of poor outcomes is at an all-time low. There's a generational shift in expectations. It's no longer acceptable for an appliance to break, for a car to break down, for bananas not to have a perfect shape. In obstetric care, even natural consequences or outcomes, such as miscarriage, abruption, diabetes, All right, went to get the connection back for Dr. Roach, um, who has just started sharing a, with us um, a, a very interesting, I, I was very taken by that um, case of the woman who was trying um, and focused on her fertility for 17 years only to be diagnosed. I'll just take a moment to pigeonhole functionality, have the opportunity to add some questions. Um, give a look at pigeonhole now, and obviously it's too early now, but as Dr. Roach continues with his presentation, uh, pop in a question that um, I can then uh, share at the end of the session. I wasn't actually sure whether it was my internet um, that had dropped out, um, which would have been better than Dr. Roach's. So let's see what we can achieve here. Dr. Roach, Hello. welcome back. Uh, when did you lose me? <laughs> you, you, yes, I was going to say, uh, you were talking about the assumption of um, that things will go well and um, uh, that really we've shifted to it being difficult to accept poor outcomes, even natural events. Although when you talked about appliances, I have to say that I think that um, we all come to expect appliances not to last that long. But to come back to the serious issue, um, you mentioned even natural events like miscarriage and um, placental abruption. It's hard for people to, to accept. It's a very um, yeah. interesting point. And I think that a person's response to any outcome is contextual and therefore highly variable. And while courts try to apply an objective lens to litigation, I think that that's counterintuitive. And the significance of an adverse outcome <coughs> can only be subjective. 
I think that women arrive at their obstetric care through many different pathways, and it might be economically driven or related to health insurance. It could be the perception of family or friends. And I'll, I'm going to talk about the public hospital context and the, and the private obstetrician in a private hospital. But I think that there, is a, there are different reasons for arriving, and it might be your perception of the care that you're going to receive. What, what it is known is that women have a strong preference for continuity of care, whether that be with a private obstetrician, with a midwife or in a group practice. And I think that this is highly relevant when we discuss the impact of trans transactional medical care. In the private sector, a private obstetrician takes on some sort of celebrity status and private obstetricians now market themselves aggressively through social media platforms. Even those who do not are discussed on online forums. Having a baby is a thing, like a wedding or a 40th birthday. In the old days, when most obstetricians were exclusively male, it was fashionable to fall in love with your obstetrician. And while that's obviously cringeworthy now, it points to the need that humans feel for a relationship with their service providers. Forming some sense of connection is a way of shoring up support, engaging your caregiver as your advocate, creating a safety net for you and your baby. In many ways, this desire for the obstetrician or the midwife to be everything sets us up for failure. It's almost inevitable that the patient will feel let down in some way, but I think that it points to that the desire for relational does come from the patient, but it's an opportunity for the care provider. In the past, an obstetrician was available for 24 hours a day. That's the contract that was established, but things have changed in the private sector. Obstetric fees are much higher. Obstetricians work in group practices, take weekends off and have holidays. Influenced by the feminization of the obstetric workforce, obstetricians will hand over during a labor to pick up children or attend to other duties. Reflecting a broader social context, younger doctors have a different expectation of work-life balance and are simply not prepared to work all of the time. In turn, the women who are pregnant are questioning the value proposition of expensive obstetric care. If my obstetrician isn't available when I want them, what's the point of paying them all that money? Transactional care is a two-way street. I'm paying you, so I expect the service versus this is what you get if you pay me. It isn't just about direct financial transaction. In the public system, a woman doesn't hand over payment, but she has an expectation. She paid her taxes and in Australia, healthcare is her right. The public sector sets up a different expectation. The facility is available and provides high standard care, but the message is very clear. You're part of a bigger system and one that's designed to look after you, but it's one for the collective good and the rights of the individual are limited. You may have to wait longer. You, you won't have the doctor of your choice. There will be shift changes. The food and furnishing will be of a lower quality. It's not quite like being treated like a number, but the anonymity of the public care can sometimes feel that way. For the practitioner too, the public patient becomes the next in line or is defined by her pathology, for example, the woman with placenta previa. Now, if the outcome meets expectations and there are no complications, then transactional care is all that's required. It might not be pleasant or satisfying, but like my plan analogy, it gets you from point A to point B with relative safety. But if the outcome is not satisfactory, and as this audience knows, the difficulty is defining an acceptable outcome, that's why this conference is happening. And then the limitations of transactional medicine become very apparent. If a woman doesn't perceive that the doctor is her advocate, that she is not at the center of her care, that the doctor or the hospital has other priorities or agendas, then her interpretation of an outcome that she does not desire is completely different. It's no longer a matter of they tried their best, rather it's they let me down. And of course we could blame women for expecting too much, but that's inappropriate and a waste of time. We can blame the plaintiff lawyers for encouraging women to sue doc doctors, but I think that would be disingenuous. Rather, we can look at our own profession and say, a good line, which is from an advertising guru, Seth Godin, if your audience isn't listening, it's your fault, not theirs. In other words, if doctors in the health system sell a message of a perfect outcome, then we better deliver or else. Now that doesn't mean we should throw our hands up in despair and refuse to engage. 
After Rogers versus Whitaker, doctors reacted defensively and said, OK, I'll tell her every complication that can occur. But that wasn't the point. The judge was clear that the doctor had an obliga obligation to discuss risks that were material to the patient. But I'm not a mind reader. No. But if you perceive the woman in front of you as a person rather than a pathology, if you made an effort to understand her needs, her wishes, her expectations, then you would discuss what was relevant to her. We know that on average, a doctor will interrupt a patient within 18 seconds of the beginning of a consultation. And yet we also know that if we let that woman talk, she would finish speaking in two minutes and it would satisfy two needs. The doctor gets the patient's perspective and the patient feels heard. One of the quotes from the obstetrician who spoke in the Montgomery case, if you were to mention shoulder dystocia to every diabetic patient, if you were to mention to any mother who faces labour that there's a very small risk of the baby dying in labour, then everyone would ask for a caesarean section and it's not in the maternal interest for women to have caesarean sections. Now, setting aside the many, many layers that, that come out of that, that uh, comment and the fact that we do know that when women are informed of risk, they perceive it in different ways and it doesn't automatically mean that they will choose a particular pathway. We all know that there's a risk of getting on a plane, but we still do it, or there's a risk of getting in a car, but we still do it, but we want to be informed of that risk. The judge said, the law on consent has progressed from doctor focused to patient focused. The practice of medicine has moved significantly away from the idea of the paternalistic doctor who tells the patient what to do even if it, this was thought to be in the patient's best interests. A patient is autonomous and should be supported to make decisions about their own health and to take ownership of the fact that sometimes success is uncertain and complications can occur despite the best treatment. In a transactional system where experts believe that they hold the wisdom and know what's best for the patient, failure to understand what makes that woman tick is no longer acceptable. The basic premise is that women have the right to determine their own reproductive destiny, to be informed and to make decisions autonomously. There's actually a fantastic beauty with this um, for a realisation for the medical profession, because once that sinks in, actually the pressure is reduced. I don't have to choose for you. I don't have to carry that burden. Shared decision making is far less stressful than being in charge it's actually quite liberating for the doctor. <clears throat> but if we're going to get to that point, we need a shift in the paradigm of medical care. Now, possibly I'm too romantic, but I think that medicine is a vocation. I don't question the need for financial rewards, systems, efficiencies, allocations of the health dollar, or limitations on the service that we provide. I don't question the right of a doctor to work for a reasonable reward, to have a personal and private life, to care for their own physical and mental health. But I can't accept that healthcare is simply a transaction that one size fits all. No one was forced to be a doctor and it's not a life that you end up with by chance. Medical practice is a choice. Sure, there are external factors that influence our experience and satisfaction of the job. Sure, it's difficult demanding and occasionally distressing, not a great way to make a living a lot of the time. But that's not the client's fault. And it's not her responsibility. If a flight's cancelled, or our pizza arrives late, or an appliance is faulty, we demand a refund. With medical care, it's open-ended, no guarantees. Sorry that it didn't work out, but the fee still stands. And that's simply not fair. Furthermore, transactional doesn't just refer to fees and a contract. It's also about human interaction. It's the difference between looking someone in the eye when you're speaking to them or looking at your computer when you take their history. It's whether you stand at the door or you sit on the bed. It's whether you call with results or your secretary or your resident does. It's whether you respond when the patient says that I have pain or something isn't right or I'm worried. It's as fundamental as whether doctors actually see the patient as a person or simply as pathology. A conveyor belt approach to medicine is fine and often sold as being much more efficient. But then the client should have a right to compensation for an inferior outcome. We can't have it both ways. And by the way, if we expect the doctor to provide relational care, 
Society also needs to support that doctor and compensate that doctor. You can't have it both ways. I think that we can reduce the risk of litigation in obstetrics through better education and training of obstetricians. That's what we tend to concentrate on through improved systems and through the introduction of no-fault compensation. But I think we can actually do better than that and actually change the entire paradigm. I think that we can improve the quality of our communication, we can care for women as an individual, and we can practice with kindness and compassion and respect. I think that we need to make an effort to understand a woman's context, to understand what matters to her. After the Montgomery case, the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists issued a statement. After much internal discussion, we have realised that to get this right in women's health, and especially maternity, this involves much more than redoing our consent forms. It's all about communication with our patients. As Demetra said, we were talking earlier about telehealth and for me, that's been a really interesting experience because to begin with, it all seemed actually quite positive. It meant that patients didn't have to travel in to see me. We've always discussed this, particularly in rural and remote areas. It, uh, it saves that time for them. It meant that I could uh, log on and uh, I was doing it really using a FaceTime platform. And I could see them, they could see me, we could have a chat. A lot of gynecological care in particular, and, and often some obstetric visits don't actually require physical contact. Contact, but and it seemed to work. It seemed to work in the initial thing, but as the days and months dragged on, I realised that my ability to connect through the screen was very, very limited, and that I wasn't getting the nuances that I needed. And so, I think that while telehealth may well be a valuable new tool and a good adjunct particularly with someone who you already know and you already have a sense of connection with, I don't believe that it's something that is sustainable as a default or as a replacement for the way for seeing someone face to face. And I think that this conference is another good example. It's fantastic that we can deliver it across time zones in different cities, that we haven't had to leave home, that we don't need to stay in a hotel. But ultimately what you seek is being in a room with other people, having a sense of connection with them, and, um, and, 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 and feeling that, uh, that, that you're with them. I thought that I'd share with you two other things. One was my own experience uh, as a clinician, which um, I, I, I think I, I, no, I don't think, I know I have imposter syndrome. I always worry when I got asked to give this talk, I thought, no, seriously, why did you ask me? And what could I possibly contribute? And have I just been asked because it's the, I happen to have the title of president at the moment? And I worried about it and I wrote it and I rewrote it and I thought, will I get my message across? And I was reflecting on my own clinical practice, which is about a desire to have a relationship. So that's something that comes from me. It isn't something that's sort of a reflection of that's something that I think needs to be done. It seems to fulfill a need in me uh, in, the, in the interaction that I have with other human beings. And... I found that in doing that, it means that I have a desire to, to help that person and then I have a concern when, when they have a problem. And I link that with, uh, with being an expert witness and looking at a lot of uh, circumstances. And it's really interesting that what comes across every time is that the plaintiff in some way feels let down, that they thought that when they walked into that doctor, that that doctor was going to be the person who advocated for them, that they cared about them, that it wasn't just about their technical skills or their um, medical knowledge. And, 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 I, and I do think that patients still make their assessment on competence. And so, but once they have reassured themselves that their practitioner is competent, then they want to believe that that practitioner is acting in their best interest. And that sense of letdown when that's not the case is uh, extremely strong. We recently sold our house, and one of the things that, you know, real estate agents get a terrible name. The real estate agent that we had was superb. and But the reason I perceived her as superb actually probably had nothing to do with her professional skills, which were demonstrated absolutely. But it was more that at every step of the, along every step of the way, I felt that she was acting in our interests. 
And so if a patient perceives that the doctor is acting in her interest, then the way that she interprets her care becomes completely different. And I often see when the plaintiff becomes angry, when there's that switching point, which is either the plaintiff or a friend or a family saying, I can't believe that happened to you, is because they perceive that the doctor either no longer cares or didn't care or was taking advantage of her or didn't actually get to know her or didn't understand what her needs or her context were. And so we, rather than, I think, trying to solve the problem of litigation because that's the point at which we've arrived at, or I think that maybe if we constantly emphasise that actually there is value in getting to know somebody, that these are not the soft skills, that these are not sort of touchy-feely unimportant things, but they're critical in human interaction and, and, and realise how fundamental they are, I think if we wake up to that and we educate doctors and nurses and those in the health system that, uh, that being greeted, being cared for, being valued uh, is actually something that needs to become part of the culture in medicine and, uh, and rather than a transactional fee-for-service approach, then I think that we could change that pathway, get better clinical outcomes, have better, if you like, patient satisfaction, but I think also reduce the risk of litigation. I thought I'd finish with a poem, something that I read, and it's from an American poet, Susie Cassin, and it's called The Maxims of Medicine. And while it refers to him and his, or man, I think that we can generalise it to all patients. Before you examine the body of a patient, be patient to learn his story. For once you learn his story, you will also come to know his body. Before you diagnose any sickness, Make sure there is no sickness in the mind or heart, for the emotions in a man's moon or sun can point to the sickness in any one of his other parts. Before you treat a man with a condition, know that not all cures can heal all people, for the chemistry that works on one patient may not work for the next, because even medicine has its own conditions. Before asserting a prognosis on any patient, Always be objective and never subjective. For telling a man that he will win the treasure of life, but then later discovering that he will lose, will harm him more than by telling him that he may lose, but then he wins. Thank you for the invitation to talk to you today. Thank you, Dr Rowe. I wonder if we have a few minutes um, that we can uh, just explore some of those issues with you further, Dr Roach. Um, we uh, could have questions from our attendees, but if I could just make a few comments. I was really struck by your reference to um, uh, it, the finding that it takes 18 seconds for a doctor to interrupt a patient when they would finish in two minutes. and. Um, as a plaintiff medical negligence lawyer, I early on recognised the need for me to do my bit in terms of continuity of care and I find that hard to see the same general practitioner, so I'm just committed to going to the same clinic. But I've also been struck by um, the way some GPs, I've called it um, ask closed questions, so clearly patients go all over the place and they have worked out a way to focus patients and I feel like saying you don't need to do that with me I'm going to be very efficient and to the point um, but it, it kind of it kind of knocks you off kilter so um, is that a study finding that uh, doctors interrupt patients and yet if they just listened it wouldn't be it wouldn't take too long for them to get to the point and they might actually hear something that's meaningful yeah, and, I, and I, I don't even know that that's necessarily confined to doctors, but I think that it will be mm. in any professional setting. If I walk into your office, you're thinking, yes, mm. I've already heard these sort of cases before. I, I yep. know exactly yep. where you're going. So if I could just get a few things done, and I mean, you know, the other word for that's heuristics, where we're always jumping ahead of the person um, in our yep. conversation. And so I think that that's normal human behaviour. So it's one that mm. needs to be overcome. And, and, and for me, it was when I read that, I, I thought to myself, no, I'm a really kind, compassionate doctor. I would never do that. But I realised that that's exactly what I did. So, in fact, now when I have a consultation, I actually put my pen down and I sit on my hands until the woman finishes talking. And then I wait until she's finished and then I say, okay, 
is it okay if I structure this in some way so that I go through and I need to fill in a few gaps? And then, and the other part of it is at the end is saying, is there anything that we've missed? You know, is there anything yeah. that you think that you'd like to cover? But that that's just a, a an example of mm. interaction. I actually, I didn't say mm. it in the talk, but I was thinking even what you said before in the green room, what were we all trying to do? We were in a very brief period of time trying to get to know one another. You know, we shared some personal information. We shared, it, it's a very normal human thing. And I think that yeah. the professional, it, it has such enormous benefit. This conversation with you now is affected by the fact that we formed a relationship, whereas it had just been our titles, it will be a different conversation now. So mm. relational is, I think, inherent in the person, in, in people, in mm. human society. Mm. And, and I think we shouldn't remove that from a professional context. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, we do have a question here. Um, uh, the question is, do you think junior obstetricians, and in fact, you've touched on the shift of expectations and approaches, but the question is, do you think junior obstetricians are given the time and tools to learn relational care? No, and I think that, that's, that therein lies the dilemma, is that how do we match what we, we believe to be the best way to deliver that care, patient expectations, and then say to junior doctors, we expect you to do all of this within the sort of time frame that you're working and the, and you're learning and so maybe in the end ultimately it's an impossible ask and and so this needs to be examined in a in a wide societal context in the end every individual's need can't be met but i think that and that's what that's where if you want to change something you have to change culture you can't just change a law. You can't just change the training program. You can't just say to people, this is what you should do. It has to be practiced and practiced and practiced. And I suppose even me in my tiny little way, just talking about it and just constantly talking about it and refusing to stop talking about it when working in that area of mental health in pregnancy, over 15 years, we saw a change in the paradigm. And so maybe when invited to speak at this conference, I left on that opportunity because I think that we need to just keep on saying uh, you need to, that, that that should be part of your professional role. So, but I think for junior doctors, it's much harder. So the two parts, one is the expectation that they're living with, with uh, patients and the other is what their own expectations are of their professional life and uh, the balance of that with their private life. And the shift in the paradigm that you were talking about before. Um, in, I have to say, in terms of again, um, I think actually plaintiff lawyers are uh, can can help sometimes in communicating to people who are concerned about poor outcomes about how sometimes these things do happen and explain um, even if they've heard it before um, that risks are in a, a part of the obstetric healthcare or all the whole range of healthcare and, and the question to determine is whether this was an unavoidable outcome and related to um, a failure in the care or one of those things that can happen and sometimes the process in itself gives the person validation and, and answers and sometimes it's apparent to me that maybe maybe they haven't had the kind of communication that they could have had but Sometimes I think it's also about listening and that come back to come back to what you said before about 18 seconds to interrupt. That's actually something for all of us to take on. So I certainly will be more mindful of that too, because that's exactly what we do when we meet our clients. We are listening to their story and it's really important mm. to, to hear that um, without because we're always we are as professionals, I think, thinking in terms of the lens of you know, where are the issues? What do I need to address here? But sometimes we need to remember to to listen. Um, 
So thank you so much for that thoughtful talk. In fact, I'm, um, I'm providing you a message that's been put on the Q&A, which is a thanks from um, uh, someone in attendance thanking you for this thoughtful talk. And it does have a lot of layers that I think uh, we'd be, um, it'd be a good thing to go away and think further about the layers of the matters that you've raised um, with us today. And we wish you all the very best with your work in raising awareness about the mental health um, of uh, patients, expectant mothers and new mothers. Thank you Thank very you. much, Dr. Roach. Thanks for having me.